Good morning and welcome to To The Point. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about the budget, a process being made more difficult this year by the revelation that up to a half billion dollars a year for the next decade and a half will be going to pay for those MEDC mega tax credits. This week, we sat down with a man who will be right in the center of the storm when it comes to putting together the spending for the state, the Senate Appropriations Chairman, Lowell Senator Dave Hildenbrand. Senator, I want to start talking about the position that you hold now, because when I say Senate Appropriations Chair, there are a lot of people at home that have a vague idea of what that is, but as a technical matter, this is, I mean, it certainly is an honor to be selected as the Appropriations Chair, but this job can be one pain in the neck because everybody wants something uh, from a budgetary standpoint, and it's not just the outside entrance. Every member wants something. The governor wants something. House members want something. You get a lot of visitors, don't you? I do, and uh, you know it's been an honor to be chosen by the Senate Majority Leader to uh, take on this responsibility. And you know, the Senate Appropriations Chair, I have a counterpart in the House, the House Appropriations Chair, and we're responsible to manage uh, the state budget every year uh, and shepherd that through the legislative process. And uh, it's an important responsibility that I take very seriously. We have a constitutional um, uh, responsibility to balance our state budget every year. I wish the federal government would have the same uh, constitutional requirements, but here in Michigan, um, our state budget is just over $52 billion annually uh, for the current year. Next year's proposal is just a little bit more than that. Um, but uh, So it's a lot of money, uh, a lot of programs, and our job is to really to, to dig in, uh, be the taxpayer watchdogs, if you will, to ensure that we're getting good outcomes on all the programs that the taxpayers of Michigan are financing uh, and to sort through all the issues of the, st of the state budget. And so it's been a real honor and uh, it's a lot of work, but I'm really, really enjoying it. What people don't perhaps appreciate is that you, your staff, and your colleagues have to go through thousands of pages of budgetary and discretionary spending items, even though when you talk about that 52 or edging up towards $54 billion, you're only dealing with a couple of budgets in there, one of about 10 billion, one of about maybe 12 billion when it comes to school aid and, and the, the general fund at about 10 billion. And that's where most of the discretionary stuff comes from. Nonetheless, there are a lot of individual line items you have to go through. There are, and you know, just over 40% of our budget is federal money. Most of that is earmarked for different programs, a lot in public health. So a lot of the money just is a flow through from the federal government earmarked for specific programs or entitlements for our state, but we still have to appropriate that through the process. Um, but a big chunk of, of our budget is uh, public health. That's our biggest budget. It's almost $16 billion, uh, about a third of our state budget. And then the next is uh, school aid, the, the, the legislation or the bill budget that funds our public schools in Michigan. And that's over $13 billion. And, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, things throughout that budget that we really negotiate and work through um, because there's different programs, uh, different funding levels that we have to sort out depending on where you live in the state and, and, and when changes were made over the years. So yeah, those budgets take a lot of work and uh, our subcommittees are starting to work where we bring in people to testify about what's happened over the years and that's the beginning part of the process and as those sub subcommittees formalize their work, it comes to the full committee where we have 17 senators that then look over all the budgets and pass budgets out and we take formal votes on those budgets and then we consider them in the full Senate and then they go over to the House of Representatives. So it's quite a long process, very detailed, um, but you know, again, it's an important responsibility to be the watchdogs of the tax dollars that we take in from the public. This is a process that in the past four years has been wrapped up by early summer, sometime in June uh, by the most part. But you were here in days when it was not wrapped up in such a, a timely manner. And it's, uh, you can blame it on a number of different factors. Some would say it was the people involved. Some would say it was the economic, economic circumstance involved. But nonetheless, we saw this government taken to the brink of shutdown, or what I call faux shutdown, because it was never really shut down in any effective way. But we saw that time and time again. Give me the difference between what that was and what this is. Well, that was a, a miserable time. Uh, you know, I, I was still an honor to serve here, but I didn't like how this capital was run at that time. And uh, we still got the job done, but we did it um, with only hours to spare before the end of the fiscal year. And that's not a good way when, uh, you know, people are backed in a, a corner to make decisions. That's not a good way 
uh, to deliberate and make decisions. So the way we do it now um, under new leadership is great and we um, um, are quick in our work but we're thorough in our work and the de decisions don't get any easier the longer you delay. So the fact that we're making tough decisions uh, four months before the fiscal year start is a good thing. And we're making the decisions, getting the job done. So all of our partners who count on state revenues to do whatever function it is, whether it's uh, public safety and state police, whether it's transportation, whether it's school aid or public health, they all know what to expect four months down the road uh, when the fiscal year actually starts. So it's a lot better, it's, it's good government, it's good management, and it's been great that we've been able to do it that way over the last four years. And important to note that that school budget actually starts in July, so it's really important to get it done in time for those folks, because sometimes you were still working on budgets in October or nearing October, and their budget had already been in place for a few months. Well, and school had already started, actually, uh, for about a month before they even knew actually what the revenues were going to be um, to operate their school for the year. So it just wasn't a good way to, to, to run state government and, and our state budget. There is a part of that that lingers, and as you and I are recording this today, uh, we got a little finer focus, if you will, on some of these tax credits that were approved during that same period of time. And if I'm not mistaken, over the next 15 to 17 years, that could cost taxpayer money of $9 billion plus dollars, or could go up to that high. That's money that would have to, at least initially, would be coming out of the general fund and that you would have to appropriate around. So if next year there's a $450 million tax credit bill that is due out there, that's $450 million out of a $10 billion budget that you don't have to spend. And it looks like that may be the norm or could be over the next 15 to 17 years. How do you deal with that? Well, the tax credits that were put in place, um, a, a lot of them back in the late 2000s when the economy was really at the bottom, it was tanked. And we were doing everything we could possible to uh, create a, a lot of uh, carrots, if you will, to keep companies here and retain the jobs. People were fleeing the state, jobs were leaving the state, and we were really um, doing everything we can. We were a little desperate in doing things to try and keep jobs and businesses here. Um, well, now that the economy is getting better and uh, those tax credits still are in place, the companies are now cashing them in, if you will, and they're very valuable. And so what we found ourselves is now having to pay those out. And we got to do a better job of putting our arms around what that's going to cost us long term so we can budget it. There are estimates that it's in the billions of dollars long term. But I think we have to open them up again, make them more transparent and predictable so we can budget each year of what that cost could be. And uh, we'll, we'll have to have a line in the budget or a fund in the budget to make sure that as those come due and are, and are turned in by employers of the state that we're able then to honor those. Um, there were agreements made um, by a former administration and a, a former legislature and uh, I think we have to honor them and they are long term but at some point they will phase out and then we can move on to normal business but um, it's difficult in the short term but uh, we're committed to dealing with it. I don't want to get bogged down in these but I've been asking other members about this so I want to ask you because you are as the chair of the Appropriations Committee, uh, certainly have a viewpoint of this. I appreciate the fact that the governor says, well, look, uh, we can't really tell what these tax credits are doing or, or exactly where they're going because we as a state or as elected officials don't have the right and in fact are prohibited from looking at people's income tax returns. And on the surface, I understand that. I don't necessarily want you to have access to my tax returns or any other elected official. On the other hand, you're not giving me three or four hundred million dollars a year. So is there something the legislature can do to, to strike a balance so we do have some idea? Because I know that we've tried over the years to find out about these companies that are getting these tax credits and we get stonewalled. We are told that the information is not available. We can't get it. And, and the governor said that he runs into the same thing. So we're paying out this taxpayer money and we really don't know what it's doing. I, is there a way to, to work around that? I think there is. I mean, I think we have to strike the balance between taxpayer confidentiality, like you talked about, but also getting the information that we need um, to predict and, and plan for these tax credits when they come due. So there is a balance that I think we can strike to protect taxpayer information, but also get the information we need. Um, you know, these are, these are agreements that are, have been made. We have contracts. So I think we can be very confidential in the work we do, but also be able to plan for the future. 
Uh, let's talk about the governor's budget. He rolled it out uh, a little bit ago. Uh, last week we talked about it. We sat down with the governor. Uh, there were almost universally uh, reports from every member I've talked to that, hey, there's some things in there we like. And there's some things in there we really don't like. Uh, and so now it's your job to, to get the, the likes and don't likes hammered out, get something that you can get uh, enough votes for in the Senate, presumably in the House, and get the governor to sign. What was your overall take on his budget? I think it's a pretty sound budget. I, you know, I um, I'm talked a lot about prioritizing our spending uh, from a state government standpoint. And the governor's made making large investments in education. And I think uh, with that, investment has to come accountability so we have outcomes and we're working on that end from a policy standpoint so we're sure that in our k-12 system and our community college system and our university system that we're getting good outcomes that people are getting good value for their dollar and they're getting a good education um, so that is just as important as the investments that we're making but investment in education is is long term it's going to benefit our state and our people for a long long time so i think that's good um, there's some concerns i have the governor has suggested or proposed some fee increases uh, throughout the budget. Um, I like to take a different approach. I want to prioritize our spending and I want to be um, uh, very, very um, d targeted in the spending and, and um, not get caught up too much in increasing revenues or fees uh, to the taxpayers of Michigan. So I want to take a good hard look at that. Um, there may be some arguments of why uh, some of these fees or taxes uh, need to be extended or increased, but I, I initially have some concern about going in that direction, but we'll work it through the process, through a public process and through testimony and see what, what we learn. We'll continue to talk about the budget and the roads next to the point. Welcome back to To The Point. Senator Dave Hildenbrand is the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, and as such, he'll be right in the middle of putting together a budget for the coming year for the state of Michigan. There are a lot of unknowns and a lot of question marks, including what happens to that ballot proposal on May 5th. We talked to him about a number of subjects, including that, and he tells us how he's planning for it. Let's continue our conversation about the governor's budget because he's had a couple of other things in there. He has been putting a big emphasis on trying to get technical career training to become more a part of the norm in high schools and even post-secondary education to get people to understand that going to college is a great idea but also going to a career-based education is also a good idea he's also talked about third grade reading tests all of these things kind of rolled in some that may or may not require a lot of appropriation is the governor on the right track when he's talking about those kind of things no question. Uh, we know that the jobs that are available out there today in Michigan don't necessarily necessarily require a college education or a university education. Now you need education beyond high school. And it seems to me over the last couple of decades there's sort of this stigma with students who don't want to go to the university. And it seems to be a lot of our teachers and counselors and even parents are always pushing uh, their, their students or their children into uh, the university track and um, we know that you can make a good living uh, with a good middle income job with uh, not necessarily a four-year degree you can get some training uh, at a two-year institution or or some other accreditation institution to get the training you need to get a good job so the governor's taken the lead on it and a lot of us in the legislature including myself agree with it that uh, there's another good track if you want to pursue it in vocational training and skill training to get a good job um, that we have available out there in Michigan. When the governor proposes a budget, it is not unlike what happens in Washington, on maybe a little bit more polarized there, but uh, the governor proposes and then the legislature disposes and what you send back to him will not be what he sent over to you and he will be included in those negotiations as I know that, that you talk along the way. Um, are there any big heavy lifts that you see in this budget where you have, I know you mentioned the fees, but I, I don't know how pivotal those are in, in the long term of getting this budget done. Are there any places that you're concerned that that the legislature and the governor or you and the governor may have those big chasms that are going to take a while to hammer out? Well, I do think it's the whole fee structure of how we fund uh, some of the departments. And I think that's, um, we have a lot of questions to ask about that. And, you know, the governor has one philosophy about sort of a user pay system. If you get a, a license or a, 
uh, permit or something from the state, um, you know, he wants that to be a user fee system where you pay a fee or and increase maybe that fee to, to pay for the services covered, and that's one philosophy, and um, which has some merit. But uh, a lot of us agree that uh, if we prioritize our spending here in Lansing and are able to free up revenues, that we can fund the departments and the programs uh, with some more general fund revenue. So um, that's, a, I think, a strong debate a philosophical sort of difference of how we fund some of the programs and some of the functions, specific functions of our departments and agencies. And so I think that will probably be some of the major sort of hang up between the, the governor and the legislature. But um, by and large, I think we have a great working relationship and uh, we agree on getting the budget done, balanced in a timely fashion again. So I think we're, we'll um, just work through those issues as they arise. And But I feel very good about getting this job done in a, in a timely and appropriate fashion. Timely? It becomes even more timely because if you get this budget done, when is the next revenue estimating conference? May, early May? Mid-May. Okay. In middle of May. By the time that revenue estimating conference comes around, something remarkable will have happened or not happened, and that is that the voters of the state of Michigan will have approved or not approved of a ballot initiative to take care of roads. Now, we're going to talk about that because you said something a minute ago that I find very interesting, and I want to try to relate that back to how we got to this roads package, but let's talk about how it affects the appropriations process. Because the governor, if I understand this, and if I misspeak, obviously you'll correct me, but if I understand this right, the governor allocated just enough money for the roads, for MDOT, to get the federal matching funds back that you have to put up so much money to get the federal money to come back in, clearly with the assumption that after May 5th, there would be a lot of extra money coming back into the roads that it'll be earmarked for roads because of this deal that was hammered out in the lame duck. Uh, first of all, is that more or less the way the budget was presented by the governor? Is that his working theory? It, it seems like that's the direction he was going at that time. So if you pursue that direction, even up to that point, I mean, is it, is it possible that on May 6th, I'm not making a prediction here, but, but if this thing doesn't pass on May 5th, on May 6th, you're going to have to get out some big shovels and start backfilling the, uh, the MDOT budget because they don't have enough to do what they need to? Well, what I want to remind people is that we still spend over $3 billion every year on our infrastructure, and that's gas tax revenue, that's federal dollars that come into the state, uh, that's registration fees that people pay for their vehicles. All that adds up to over $3 billion that we just spend on an annual basis just to maintain and build our roads and bridges currently. So what we're talking about is this is additional dollars if the voters do pass that ballot question in May. So it's not like we won't have any money at all. It's just we wouldn't have that increase to spend and invest on roads and bridges. So I don't, the, the, the infrastructure of Michigan won't fall apart if this doesn't get approved on May 5th, um, but we just won't have those increases that, that some have argued we need. So I, I take it from, from that that it's not going to have a big bearing then on your appropriations process. I mean, you'll be aware of it, obviously, but it, it's not going to have a big effect about how you go forward with this process now. We're going to plan as though, I mean, that question's on the ballot and it's up to the people of Michigan to decide. Uh, we're going to move forward as though it doesn't pass under, and we're going to plan under current law, under current revenue streams. And then if it does pass, uh, then we'll make adjustments at that point. We don't want to set expectations, uh, from my standpoint, I don't want to set expectations thinking that that may pass and uh, you know, set kind of our framework with it being passed and then if it fails, having to come back and reduce all those numbers. So we're gonna um, proceed as, under current law and then if that does pass, we'll make the adjustments afterwards. I get no sympathy from guys like you who have spent many more late night hours in the chamber than I have, although I've spent a few in there as well. And in this last, lame duck session that produced this very uh, process that we're talking about, we were here for a good long while, starting uh, with the announcement midday that there was an agreement, which wasn't really an agreement, it was a framework of an agreement that had to be hammered out, and there was a lot of horse trading or legislative bargaining that went on throughout the night into the early morning, and something was finally passed, something that many of us had not heard of before, something that many observers thought was going to be an either or if it was going to go this direction. If you weren't going to be able to do the Senate plan, which was also not very favorable to some folks, and apparently a non-starter over in the House. But what was rolled out was something that had 
some more money for education to backfill for the money for the gas tax that, or the, the sales tax that would be taken off gas, all kind of complex. And politics is the art of the possible and that's what was possible. But I set that all up like this to ask you this. You just said a minute ago that decisions don't get easier if you wait longer to do them and it's a bad idea to get backed against the wall to make decisions. Isn't that what happened in lame duck? It was and, and it's not the way I would have liked to approach this uh, problem and potential solution. And um, we, we did do it late at night and it was one of the reasons why I didn't support that proposal uh, to, um, to increase the sales tax in Michigan. I think, um, I do think we need to invest more in our roads, um, but increasing the sales tax in Michigan um, has some pretty serious long-term tax policy implications that go far beyond just investing more in our roads. And um, so, you know, I, I hope the public thinks long and hard and, and does the research before they make a vote on May 5th um, because it will have some far-reaching implications. And if it doesn't pass for some reason, I'm committed to invest more in our roads and bridges in the state, but we'll find a different way to do it. If it, if it doesn't pass, and let me put the qualifier, I think some of those of us who follow the legislature are always waiting breathlessly for something dramatic to happen. And so perhaps we assign too much pressure to this. But if it doesn't pass, does that really take a lot of oxygen out of the room as far as getting other things done? Because at least for a short term, won't there be some kind of a scramble on the part of at least the administration and some of your colleagues to, to try to figure out what the plan B is? Because best I understand that there is no plan B right now. Well. Our job is to prioritize the spending of this state, and you know uh, a lot of the money is restricted fund, but we do have some general fund where we have some discretion over the spending. And when I ran for office, I talked a lot about we have to prioritize our spending, and if roads and bridges become the number one priority, then our budgeting and appropriations process needs to reflect that, and we will have to dig in and find now. I'll be the first to admit, we're not going to find over a billion dollars in discretionary funding um, to address the problem. But we can find some money, I I'm not going to put a number on it, but we can find, I would say in the hundreds of millions at least, to address some of the problems that are out there. And um, you know, that's our job, that's what I think the voters and the taxpayers of Michigan put us here in this position to do, is to take the money they send us to prioritize where it needs to go, make sure it's spent well, and, and to appropriate it in a timely and appropriate fashion. This might be a question better reserved for the governor, but I'll ask you because you watch these things pretty closely. Is this going to be the most difficult budget process that this governor has seen, even compared to the first year when he came in and, and was making a lot of kind of big, bold moves? I don't think so. I think the one, the budget he adopted when he first came into office in 2011 was a very difficult one. It, he adopted a huge budget deficit and our state was still struggling. We had very high unemployment still at that time. And so uh, he had to make some really tough, tough choices, including you know, double digit reductions in a lot of programs and budgets around uh, uh, state government. So I would say that one, his first year, uh, right out of the gates as a newly elected governor was the most difficult one. And none of them are easy. We have a lot of demands, a lot of great programs, uh, a lot of people wanting, uh, you know, to, to um, you know, increase whatever program or agency that they're dependent on or a part of. So there's a lot of demands, but we can only do so much, and our job is to balance the budget and prioritize our spending, and I'm committed to doing that. We're back with more To The Point in just a moment. Over the last few weeks, we've talked to the Lieutenant Governor, the Speaker of the House, the Democratic Leader in the House, the Senate Majority Leader, and the Democratic Leader in the House, and now the Chairman of the Appropriations Committee. We talked to the leaders in Lansing so you know exactly what's going on with government and the way they're spending your money. That's why I hope you'll join us next and every Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, to the point.